on another ATV adventure as we return to the Alabama Hills. It's been more than three years since we were last there in the spring of 2019. This time it's November and we'll get a real taste of cold high altitude winter camping in the Northern Light Camper. The Tehachapi Pass wind farms mark the midway point of the drive. Considered to be the birthplace of North American wind power, the steady winds blowing off the Mojave Desert never cease here and power more than 5,000 wind turbines. Passing by them on CA-58 is always an interesting sight. Sometimes you just can't get an early enough start and we hit the dirt road after dark. Get both campers in there and put our plan here. Setting up camp in the dark is something always to be avoided. Headlamps and flashlights will serve, but are a poor substitute for daylight. Because you really can't get a good lay of the land. Tonight, hot dogs will just have to do for dinner. Well, last night was bitterly cold and windy. 29 degrees Fahrenheit plus wind chill factor. So we only set up the bare minimum, just enough to quickly make something to eat and go to bed. This morning we finished the kitchen so we could have coffee and make a decent breakfast. And if it's cold and windy tonight, the pavilion will serve as a place for us all to get out of the cold. We found that turning on a stove burner really warms this place up. This will be dry camping. When we're boondocking, the only water we'll have for the week is what we brought with us. So every ounce is precious. The camper holds 33 gallons, a relatively small amount when you consider a week's worth of drinking water, hand and dishwashing, and toilet flushes. We did haul along additional water in seven gallon containers, and we'll use a transfer pump to refill the camper. Showers in the camper would be too wasteful, and on most extended dry camping trips, it's sponge baths only. You heat up a pot of water on the stove, pour a little on your head, lather your hair, and use the rest of the pot to rinse and clean your body. It really makes you think about how free we are with water at home, and how you can accomplish the same results with so much less. Even with all the camping equipment we brought along, boondocking is a good reminder of how much we take for granted living in the modern world. We drive to the store and return with a load of any food imaginable. We turn on the tap and clean fresh water comes out. Our climate controlled house keeps us warm and dry. We pay money and everything we need to stay alive is magically provided for us. Few people would survive if they had to hunt and grow their own food, make drinkable water and build shelter, me included. With no medicines, a tiny infected cut could easily kill you. And defending ourselves from those who would kill to steal our belongings would be another necessity. Preppers and survivalists are the rare few amongst us who regularly give this fact much thought. The rest of us are just too preoccupied with our social lives. The average urbanite has no survival skills whatsoever. It's sobering. But I digress. This boondocking trip will be different as Lyle hauled along a drum of shower water Riding ATVs every day gets you filthy dirty, and it'll be a true luxury to be able to get cleaned up easily. Even still, with five people, short military-type showers will be in order. For privacy and to stay warm, we've set up a clam ice fishing shelter. It collapses to a small size for transport, and the spring-loaded walls and roof deploy quickly. For the shower, we'll be using the portable Camp Lux Outdoor Tankless On-Demand Water Heater, a propane bottle to fire the burner, and a battery-operated pump 
to draw the water and pressurize the system. Hot. Hot. Ah, hot. Showering every day at home really is something we take for granted. And although we won't be using this every single day, it truly is a dry camping luxury. Long ago, in my backpacking days, I once went two sweat-soaked weeks without a shower. That is unless you call jumping in a freezing creek showering. So I do know how to appreciate this luxury. Our main use of water comes from washing dishes. We eat well on these trips, and that excludes low-prep convenience foods. Every meal in camp dirties pots and pans, cutting boards, plates and bowls, cups and utensils. To deal with this chore, we set up a dishwashing station. It's knock-down plastic shelving modified to hold dish pans. Set up outside, just below the outdoor shower, we have a hot water source and can control and minimize our water use. The lower shelves serve as drying racks, and there's a lot more room than in the confines of the camper's kitchen sink. And lastly, there's the golden necessity. When boondocking, we like to dig a latrine. So right away, I bet you're thinking, I'm talking about squatting over a hole. Well, no. Lyle's more innovative than that. This one's about 100 feet out of camp, behind some bushes for privacy. It's really a pretty simple affair, but absolutely functional. It's a folding metal chair with a hole cut in it. Then he attached the toilet seat. It has some plastic skids so the legs don't sink into the soft ground. We like to dig about a two feet deep hole and instead of flushing, you throw in a shovel full of dirt. When the hole starts to fill up, bury it and dig another a few feet away and slide the chair over. The camper does have a toilet in it and we use it when needed. But the black water tank is much too small to accommodate five people over the week. So if you dig one of these, you can serve water and keep solids out of the black water tank. That makes your trip to the dump station less gross. Is it fun to use? Well, kind of. But again, here's another example of increased appreciation for things taken for granted. It's almost as comfortable as your toilet at home, only this bathroom comes with a view. You ready to ride? You're not going to be left behind, are you?
Uh, I saw the wheel spinning. Is he riding good? Oh, didn't like it in back, huh? Camping breakfast. Poppy seed muffin pancakes. And who made those? Me and Grandma.
<laughs> Anything for a picture, huh? <laughs> All right. You know what it looks like? What? You know what it looks like? A ghost? What does it look like? It looks like a poop emoji. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think you're right. Yeah. What kind of music are you playing? Cactus music. How do you do that? Kind of like a guitar. Like a guitar? Yeah. Well, let's see. The only problem with this is sometimes you get pricked by the by the spines that when you're trying to play certain notes. Ow! <laughs> Ouch. See? Uh, a true statement. <laughs> Where are we going back to camp? Yeah. You are? Do you know the way to San Jose? Do you know the way? I don't know where San Jose they is from here, but I know where camp is. Okay, you lead, I will follow. Have it. I thought so, but I, I wasn't sure. Grab the handlebar here. Try to get it straight. Try to get it straight like that. Okay, push, push, push. Use your back. You got it. If you think you're coming up to the turn and you're not quite sure, just stop ahead of it so you have enough time for us to tell you if that's right or not, okay? Don't get past it. Give it some gas. Thanks for leading us back.
and John Wayne, making films initially for First National Warner Brothers and later for Lone Star and Republic Pictures. George O'Brien and Randolph Scott, representing Fox and Paramount respectively, carried on Lone Pine's connection with movies adapted from novels by best-selling Western author Zane Gray. But not all the Hollywood film companies came to Lone Pine to film Cowboys. Early on, visiting film crews talked about the spectacularly rugged scenery when they returned to Hollywood. And soon, studio location managers realized that the Sierras could double as other mountain ranges. truck down there anywhere? It's not big. <laughs> <laughs> Are you on the Zen-like monastery in the high Himalayas? Wow, it's all paved in here. that for you. I just learned the names of these peaks that we can see from this window. To the right is Lone Pine Peak. In the center is Mount Whitney Zone Overlook. And Mount Mallory is in the back there on the left. Is this the sacrificial altar right here? <laughs> it does have religious writing on it. And the infinite power. I have a panda laying down in it. <laughs> panda, panda wants to be sacrificed. I direct my, my thoughts, dive my devotion, and manifest my energy that I may know love and serve thee. Amen. Amen. That's the prayer you say after hiking up here. Mmm, 
Oh, Cheeto for you. Sit. Oh, Cheeto for you. Oh, we missed it. She Cheeto. missed it. She's it for you. Oh, oh yeah. See the rock house. Yeah, I see it. is from but mine's from China Yamaha I believe is a Japanese yeah. brand yeah but it might but they might not this one may have not come from Japan it's a big enough come now what makes you think it's from China it says well his his says manufacturer is from China. This Honda is another name Honda manufacturers country China. Is that right? Let's see. So Japanese companies are also farming out their work to China. Is Honda Chinese? No. Or Japanese? Japanese. Honda is Japanese? Mm -mm. Mine is the only American car here, American vehicle here. What about Grandma's? Yamaha. Yamaha. Uh, mine's from China. <clears throat> but we do have a Husqvarna, and that's neither China nor Japan nor the U.S. What country do you think? Russia. Because <laughs> it has a Russian sounding name? Yeah. No. Does your mom know? Yeah. Husqvarna. Do not remember. Husqvarna is sweet, Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> One more time. <laughs> Husqvarna is Swedish. I can't say it. Husqvarna is Swedish. I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Husqvarna is Swedish. <laughs> I'm not Swedish. Okay, so, so I can't you say Swedish. So say Swedish. It's Swedish. Where do you buy it? IKEA. <laughs> Everything Swedish comes from IKEA, huh? This area burned in June of 2022 in what was dubbed the Alabama Fire. The dry lightning sparked fire transformed the already barren desert landscape into one even more desolate. Have a look at what our campsite looked like three years ago before the fire. Plenty of cover for animals and the plants spread themselves according to natural selection. But wildfire is also a natural rejuvenator of the landscape and the native sagebrush scrub, burrowweed, and creosote bush are all hardy enough to survive. You can see what a year and a half of new growth looks like on this bush. Although desert plants are hardy, they're slow growers and do take years to decades to restore themselves. We as visitors are mere spectators of that natural process, and our time on Earth is not even one tiny tick of the geological clock. That tiny millisecond of existence as humans, however, will ultimately have the greatest impact on the planet.
Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm very pleased and blessed that our family, at least those of our family who can be here with us today, are joining us in our camping Thanksgiving dinner, and that the fact that we are in the wilderness makes it that much more special. Thank you for all of our family being here together and for those that aren't with us that are with other parts of family as well and in our thoughts and prayers and everybody's on a very good path and uh, thank you for some warmth here out in the cold of the desert. Clearly. Uh, thanks for the dirt bikes. Well, there you go. That's, that's reasonable. You really can't have a Thanksgiving dinner while you're camping. Minus the turkey. Well, we're having chicken, so... Faux, faux turkey. It's not like we're having hot dogs. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Breast or thigh? Uh, thigh, please. The mountains are bathed in alpenglow as the sun sets on our last night of the trip. We're reminded to give thanks not only for our good fortune, but for the beauty of the world we live in. Silhouetted against the sky, these rugged peaks will soon be traded for the more familiar trees of home. At sunrise, we're again treated to beautiful lighting as our camp basks in the morning alpine glow of daybreak. It only lasts a few enjoyable minutes, and as the light returns to normal, we're prompted to get started on this busy day. It's time to turn our attention to the task of breaking camp and remounting the camper. The dirt bikes were loaded last night, and now it's time to ready the quads for their trip back home. We leave the Hogback Creek area with a sense that someday we'll return yet again. Until then, there are so many other wilderness areas to explore and enjoy. The high desert of the Eastern Sierra is in sharp contrast to the alpine lakes and forests of the Northern Sierra. Both are unique and equally as beautiful. See ya! It's been fun! A link to my video, Northern Light Alabama Hills ATV Adventure, will appear at the end. It's packed full of springtime trail rides, beautiful scenery, and wildflowers. There's even a campfire story. So I wish you all the best in your own travels. And from my family to yours, 